if somebody could make 10000 into 10 lakh rupees why would he tell you so recession as a word i think is uh, fairly irrelevant i don't think beyond a point it means anything the money has kind of gone away many many startups are beginning to struggle and will continue to to do so thank you so much for joining in i know you must be having a crazy hectic schedule uh, it's a pleasure <laughs> no, to talk no, to no. you I'm having the most chilled out week ever. Like I'm in Rishikesh, doing like yoga, meditation stuff. So not hectic at all. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Midweek holidays as a trader. How annoyed are you? Well, I wish we were more like the West, where uh, you know they have that bank holiday concept. All the holidays get moved to either Sat Saturday or Monday or whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. I would prefer that, but you know. It is what it is. So, <laughs> so you are somebody who trades yourself. Mm, I have a team uh, uh, who have been with me for a long time. Yeah. But uh, essentially, I spend most of my time doing that. So, trading, investing, research is pretty much a vast majority of my working day. Right, and so on the days where there is a trading holiday, there's a market holiday. I know personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my uncles and aunts who who trade, and the days when the market is closed, there is a sense of restlessness. कि साढ़े नौ बजे उठ के करूँ क्या मैं? Is that something you've experienced? Yeah, definitely happens. Uh, I I feel like it happens every week because after Friday you're left with Saturday and Sunday, and often you're left wondering, क्या करूँ? What do you do on a Saturday? What do you do on a Sunday? <laughs> When we talk about trading, there is this whole debate between intraday trading uh, versus you know long term. Have you had your own journey through that, uh, and have you come to some kind of conclusion? One is better, the other is better. In terms of the odds of making money, investing long term is definitely better. Intraday trading, there is no science behind that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of chaos, market activity is random. Very few people are able to trade intraday and remain profitable for prolonged periods of time. Right. I would say investing is definitely better, but that being said, you know, investing is where you aim to make twenty percent a year returns. But if you're starting with a small pool of capital, uh, it's one of those things which is not very pragmatic. It's easier said than done. So when I began trading. So I've been trading a long time uh, as a full time uh, trading job. I started at seventeen, and I'm thirty six today. So that's like you know almost twenty uh, years. Uh, and uh, it's to the extent that I would not have missed a trading day outside of maybe you know three days spent in a hospital or something like that in the last nineteen years. Wow. Uh, even if I'm traveling, if I'm on holiday, I'm in front of my terminals. I have four of them which I uh, schlep around with me wherever I go in the world. Uh, so it's addictive intraday trading right. uh, and investing. And uh, often you give yourself more importance than you should. You feel like if you are watching what is happening, you'll be able to uh, control something, which is often not the case. But uh, you know, as long as the addiction is not hurting too much, I guess it's okay. It's very interesting to hear you say that because the whole journey of a trader who's been, say, trading for the last fifty years, uh, fifty years ago, they would have to go to the stock exchange or go to a broker or call a broker and make a trade. The time between deciding to make a trade versus the trade happening was much longer. And today it is in seconds, milliseconds. Uh, thanks to no small part to what you have done and what the change that you have made in this country. So Zeroda has played a huge role in that. Uh, when you see this, when you see the change in uh, people's behavior in this last twenty years, have you noticed any dramatic shifts in the way that people intra trade? not particularly uh, you know people it's it's both you know a funny thing but a sad thing i don't think uh, the level of expertise in intraday traders uh, or the level of information they research has gone up tremendously it's unfortunate that a large chunk of them you know still fall uh, they're still swayed 
by uh, people who pretend to make a lot of money uh, in trade trading especially on social media uh so you know there are two or three things people fundamentally do when they intraday trading one of them is something called technical analysis uh it's a science which is not really a science uh it's based on uh the logic that past patterns will recur, recur in uh, uh equity uh, markets uh, one of the key things i realized after a long time of doing intraday Day trading using technical analysis is is that might not necessarily be true. So when I started trading, uh, you know, two thousand four, two thousand five, the very first thing I did was, you know, I went and bought a bunch of uh, Steve Neeson books, uh, read about candlesticks and Fibonacci sequences and Elliott wave theory, and uh, a lot of these things make. Uh, simple stuff sound more complicated than they need to be, and they very rarely work. In hindsight, they seem to work because you can custom fit custom fit uh, indicators and time frames to kind of make it look like you know historically any indicator has worked, uh, especially something based on momentum. Especially in uh, technical analysis, since it's a lagging indicator, if you're able to curve fit a little bit, everything will look like it worked. Right. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is markets do not follow a pattern that they might have had in the past they tend to do new things uh, what happens tomorrow might not be uh, something which has happened at any time in the past but it could be something new altogether uh, and for that reason i do not believe technical analysis really works uh, so a lot of intraday people i see doing this uh, especially things like you know trading Twenty, fifty uh, day uh, time interval, moving uh, average crossovers, and right. uh, you know very simple things like you know RSI goes to seventy, they'll uh, uh, sell. It goes to below thirty, they buy. Right. Uh, these things are all programmed in a manner to work when the market is trending in one direction, right. but uh, markets can often be choppy, mm. and they can be choppy for prolonged periods of time. So if that were to happen for a Say even a six month period. I know any intraday trader using technical analysis is mathematically bound to wipe out in that much time. Wow. Uh, the other thing people do a lot while they're intraday trading is you know listen to tips and uh, uh, SMS forwards and buy penny stocks and nonsense like that. Uh, that is far worse than technical analysis. Uh, If people knew what will happen in the future, they would not be sitting and sending SMSs or going on TV and telling you what to do. Uh, they would be sitting in a room somewhere and actually doing it. Uh, definitely don't fall prey to uh, all these different uh, so-called experts on social media and on your phone uh, by virtue of SMSs who claim to know what will happen in the future and are telling you what to do. This entire conversation uh, sounds very similar to conversations I've had about astrology mm. because of pattern mm. recognition. Uh, as human you, beings, yeah. Are you a believer or non-believer? So I can uh, gauge I what am, I should say next. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am. I'm, Thank God for that. I'm. I'm sympathetic <laughs> yeah. of the efforts, yeah. and yeah. I admire the hustle <laughs> in those who yeah. sell it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we fall for it. We have such yeah. a need to see patterns that we see them even when they don't exist. Same thing with zodiacs. Same thing with I'm guessing the market uh, market changes. When uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. So we come from a Brahmin family, right? So my mother's father, in fact, was a pundit of some sort. So we've had. bouts with astrology at different phases of our life in many different ways <clears throat> i have gotten to the point now that i quite enjoy running into an astrologer because uh i feel like it's a skill set uh i don't mean in terms of you know reading the stars and your time and your date and stuff like that but in body language i feel these guys are really skilled in picking up micro cues Uh, so they will say something and see how you react. Uh, they will base it, uh, you know, whatever research they can do beforehand, notwithstanding. 
uh, I think they're tremendous readers of body language. And that in itself is a very intriguing skill to me. Yeah. So if you're going to an astrologer looking uh, to have somebody flex his skill set, which could be reading uh, body language, I think you walk away feeling happy. But if you're going to somebody who claims to tell you what will happen in the future, then I think it's yeah. probably not worth it. <laughs> That's very well put. The need mm-hmm. for control is something that is universal. Each and every one of us wants to get control over our surroundings. And this is primal. It's a, it's a very uh, primitive monkey brain thing. Unfortunately, we sometimes think that the more information we have, the more control we have. So we read newspapers, we read everything because we equate information with control. Somehow, when you talk to me about technical analysis, I feel like that is a bias and that may not be true. Is that something you you have felt yourself? Yeah. You speak very slowly. Often people tell me I speak slowly, but you know, you're even slower and more calm and composed. Uh, It's nice. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I feel like uh, we all are predisposed by many biases we have in life. Not just how we perceive the markets, but what we think we want as humans, uh, what our ambitions are, uh, what our insecurities are. These are all formed by, you know, uh, they're a factor of our childhood, our parents, our peer group, society at large. Uh, and the version of morality which is sold upon us by virtue of what era we live in. And I would feel astrology, technical analysis, all of this kind of fit into the same mold in a way. Uh, you know, I don't want to like uh, rip technical analysis apart in a way that people will tomorrow get on social media, watch this and go after me. I mean... <laughs> I mean, no harm, like for who, uh, for the people who think it works for them, you know, like kudos and long may that continue. Yeah, This is just like me wagering my opinion and saying my two cents of what I think about. It. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, it's similar to all belief systems. It's not mm-hmm. on us to break down what they believe in. If it works for them, great. But we are allowed to share our opinions from based on whatever scientific research we have read, based on our own personal experiences. Agreed. When uh, there is this whole thing of get rich quick, this is not a new phenomenon. This has always been there. Uh, today, when people talk about intraday, one of the ways they sell it is join my course. I will teach you how to turn your 10,000 into 10 lakhs. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you've come across um, even in, in the circles that you move in? Have people talked about this? I see it on social media. But I feel like I often blame the people who are so susceptible and gullible who buy into nonsense like this. You know, at some level, you know, somebody's trying to make a buck. He's trying to maybe, you know, like fleece people of their money by saying they can make 10,000 rupees into 10 lakhs. But who are these people who are subscribing to that and buying into that? Yeah. Like, you know, it, something has to be said about that too. Uh, I feel like if somebody is, uh, you know, life teaches you many lessons, but if somebody is that gullible and that vulnerable and is going to fall prey to something like that, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a very metaphorical, in a very like weird manner, it's the lesson that one requires. Mm. Uh, but off the bat if somebody says something like that I think common sense should tell you that uh, if somebody could make 10,000 into 10 lakh rupees why would he tell you and uh, he would if somebody can do that in a year within a few years he would be the richest man in the world many times over (laughs) at that rate of return immaterial of how little the corpus of money he started with right Uh, so uh, I feel like it's sad that people I'll pray to it. I feel even worse that there are people who are selling nonsense like this. Yeah. Uh, a very simple thing that people should follow. I feel most people come into the stock markets with unreasonable expectations. And uh, that's one of the big reasons they don't end up doing very well. Right. If you were to like make 7% in a bank fixed deposit and inflation, let's say, according to the government, of 8%, 
uh, if you're able to even make 15% a year in the stock market, uh, you compound that, you double your money in uh, you know under five years. I think that's an incredible rate of return. If you can double your savings, your uh, net worth every five years, yeah. uh, I don't think anybody can ask for more. Mm. And I feel for that, there are plenty of opportunities. Uh, Nifty as a whole has done maybe 11, 11.5% in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, to add a little bit of alpha to that to achieve 13%, 14% uh, is possible. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah. It is possible. And I think the aim, ambition of people entering the stock market should be that. And it should not be the whole, you know, I'll double my money in three months and six months because when you do that, you're bound to go back many, many times over. I'm very fascinated by neuroscience, obviously. Uh, I myself, I'm a neurologist. And uh, whenever I read about any market analysis or any psychology book regarding the market, I'm fascinated by how much neuroscience affects this. So in the brain, there is a primitive part called as the limbic system. And it turns out that most of the decisions that somebody takes in the market is coming from the limbic system, which is driven by primarily fear and love or greed so when and a majority of that is fear so when somebody says i want to make a lot of money it is uh, the fear of not having enough the fear of losing what they have coupled with the greed of let me quickly gain as much power as i can when you describe it in terms of 13% and 14% these are not things that the limbic system can even comprehend the idea of a percentage itself is a very evolved uh, neocortex, prefrontal cortex thing, which has evolved in the last 50,000 years. Whereas most of the decisions that somebody makes has evolved actually 2 million years ago. So most of the traders are actually trading from their monkey brains. And that's always fascinating to me. And when, when, when you talk about this, it's, it's like you're trying to educate people to move away from their monkey brain towards their human brains. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very interesting thought. But I find the subject not the brain and not neuroscience, but I find psychology very intriguing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I kind of grew up wanting to read all that I could about economics and finance. But uh, somewhere along the way, I think maybe like four or five years ago, I kind of got bored of that to a certain extent and I've spent all my time reading about history and psychology. Right. Uh, and I find it very intriguing how we, uh, you know, how similar we all are, uh, how we are rooted in the same, uh, the premise, the plot of each of our stories are so similar, but uh, we like categorizing ourselves as, you know, A is special, B is inferior, C is X and B is Y. But uh, at the very core of it, I think uh, we're all very, very alike. And even when you like extrapolate to a trading decision or an investing decision, uh, if I were to groom 100 people in a box with no exposure to the uh, foreign world, And if the same quality and quantum of information is presented to them, they would probably make very similar trading decisions. Uh, So all of our biases which make us different are uh, things we have picked up in our lives. Uh, And and, uh, I think that is the real differentiation between one trader and another. And I don't think there is any such thing as, you know, natural ability or talent, you know, all of that stuff which is sold especially in the world of finance and trading right the so-called quote-unquote trading mindset Mm. there's a lot of money spent on building that trading mindset uh, Mm. by 18 year olds 20 year olds who who travel to bombay spend 20,000, stay here for two months attend a course go back supposedly with a trading mindset and then spend the rest of their money on their first five trades this is a challenge Yeah, I know. I think, uh, well, there is something to be said about recognizing your biases Mm. and molding a trading strategy according to that. Mm. Uh, I think uh, that is possible. 
like generally in my opinion uh, most people tend to be very aggressive in the stock markets uh, if they can recognize that and you know put checks and balances in place i feel uh, the opportunity to be profitable and to derive a better system out of that to exist makes a lot of sense so suppose hypothetically you were 18 or 20 and mm -hmm. you had 50000 and you wanted mm -hmm. to trade would there be a particular way of starting with all the experience that you have now? Would there be a way that you would start? I'll tell you how I started myself because I started at that age. Yeah. Uh, I would buy penny stocks and I would buy out of the money options, which were so far out of the money. I'm talking like uh, you would need like a two standard deviation event to occur before I ever made money. Okay. Uh, but if I made money, it would be a lot of money. Hmm. Uh, but barely ever happened. Uh, there's this author, Talib, uh, yeah. Nasser Nicholas Talib. Yeah. Uh, black Swan and, events. Correct. Anti fragility and yeah. Black Swan and a bunch of really good books. So yeah. he ran a fund around this. Uh, so he said he will just bet on Black Swan events. So he will keep trying to bet into the edge cases and make money when they do happen. Uh, unfortunately for him, through the years that his fund ran, I don't think anything so stark did happen. Uh, like he even argued that, you know, COVID is not a black swan event because there were signs and they saw it coming in a certain way. Right. But I started like that. I started buying out of the money calls, out of the money quotes, uh, penny stocks, which were trading sub 10 rupees, hoping they would go to 100 rupees and right. so on and so forth. Uh, I'm saying all of this in the manner that, you know, I did it. So you please don't do it because it does not work. Uh, I probably went bust uh, multiple times between the age of 17 to 20. Uh, it took me a big uh, three, four years and many, many losses uh, to have gotten to the point where I kind of realized that, you know, <clears throat> Uh, forget what I'm doing wrong. What I'm attempting to achieve is implausible in a way. Right. And I should be more reasonable with what I'm trying to do. Right. Uh, so avoid that. Uh, I would still say uh, the simplest thing to do is to diversify, to not leverage. Uh, I think everybody at 18 starting off should do that. Right. Even if you have 50,000 rupees, uh, don't put it all in one stock. Buy two or three stocks. Buy in different sectors. Uh, I would even go one step further and say, uh, get another asset class in there, another liquid asset class. It could be gold, it could be fixed income, it could be uh, anything which acts as a natural hedge to your portfolio. Uh, so diversify, uh, do not leverage, and always remember markets are cyclical. There is the concept of markets running away does not exist. If anything has gone up a lot and is going up further, at some point it will come down. Uh, wait for that moment of chaos, which will come, if not this year, if not next year, the year after that. Right. And uh, the, the key in my mind to great investors is they have enough gunpowder when those events occur. Right. And uh, I would say, you know, don't buy anything expensive. Wait for that event. Diversify. Do not leverage. These are probably the three fundamental bits of advice I can give an 18-year-old who's starting off today. Incredible. Uh, we assume that there should be enough resources in the bank or enough support system for us to wait. So not just in the bank, but also mentally, because patience is also a resource that uh, many people don't have. They run out of patience. They, they, they jump the gun too quickly. Uh, the unfortunate part in uh, today's, at, especially in like second tier, three tier cities uh, would be that peop uh, there are kids who see YouTube videos of people promising uh, insane stuff and believe that this is their way out. And so whatever is the amount that they have, they will put in, they go all in. And that could be a very, you know, tragic story. And it's happened so many times. How do we change the conversation and especially like from your perspective as you know uh, the founder of zero tha do you think there's something that we can do to make this make this transition so that everybody becomes aware of this well i think you know just access right the one good thing which is happening across the country is everybody has internet access 
people like you are putting on all this content online uh, i think you know the more people watch this they will come they will you know you and all the other people who are in the finance space and are putting out good content when when the word gets around and if people are responsible with the content that they put in i think eventually people will get more educated otherwise there's no there's no way for anyone to reach you know everybody right like we have nudges in, in zeroda and we kind of like uh, suggest to people what they should not do mm. uh, but this i think is the way education free education available on free sources like youtube uh, which is accessible to everybody in all languages yeah makes sense have you noticed any difference uh, between indian psychology indian market psychology and traders from other countries because i'm very fascinated by how we see money versus how the west sees money i don't think there is much of a difference i feel like we're very similar to the west maybe uh, like you mentioned rightly earlier we're all more triggered by greed uh, then uh, we're more triggered by fear than we are triggered by greed mm. if i were to like give you uh, uh, you know uh, a wager and say if you were to win it you will make uh, you start off with 100 bucks if you win it you make 120 bucks but if you lose it you will lose the 100 bucks you have yeah. most people will not take that wager because that fear of losing 100 bucks is very high right uh, so i would say that is true for humans across the world uh, but in terms of a distinction i feel because they have had access to capital markets for so much longer than we have they might be a little bit uh, less averse to this fear problem than indian investors i feel uh, here because markets have only truly been around for 30 40 years in 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 a manner that retail could really access it uh, i feel we are still triggered by fear a little bit more than the west which is a great point because experience is one of the best ways to get over fear if uh, you know somebody is uh, cycling for the first time versus they're cycling for the 20th time they're not thinking about the fear part they're not thinking about falling down as much uh, the first time is always scary so as a market i think this is what they call a mature a mature market versus an immature market that you know more people are kind of gotten over their fear they're not reacting to stuff as quickly right right yeah i uh, think it's right they we keep talking about bear markets and bull markets but you've also said that everything is cyclical does it even make sense to talk about these two markets as being completely separate or should we start seeing them as part of one big chain But there are larger trends uh, i feel like india has been in a bull market largely since we opened in the 90s yeah. uh, i i think you know like what happened in india between say 1950 to 1985 1990 was quite unfortunate because uh, we had a golden opportunity uh, but we might not have capitalized upon it in the manner that one could have but ever since the 90s uh, we've largely seen a bull market uh, the problem with this is uh, like me and you i'm guessing we are similar uh, in age yeah uh, our parents our grandparents have never really seen a correction not just in equity markets but in uh, real estate markets in asset classes of all sort uh, two generations above us have never seen a bear market uh so this has kind of skewed popular popular mindset in a manner where uh, like take the example of real estate you ask any large real estate developer out there he will tell you real estate can never go down right uh, and he's saying this because his father has not seen it go down nor has his grandfather seen it go down right. uh, but history is longer than that right like if you go back and look at world history you look at what happened in the 1920s uh what happened uh, world war time in 1939 1940 or even the 60s and 70s uh, uh there have been many instances where 
people have seen corrections to the extent of 70 80% of real estate value right. and these have not been short term corrections but they've lasted for a decade or plus uh that is worrying because we haven't witnessed it uh, so that makes one wonder how we will cope with it when it does invariably happen like uh, you know every asset class has corrections and bear markets and bull markets yeah. it'll probably happen at some point in india it might not happen in the next uh, year or two years or five years or whatever right uh, but this mindset is bound to create a larger problem for us when it happens because when it does uh, Uh, i think the scale and the magnitude will be a lot more because uh, there would be no artificial floor uh, like there might have been if people were uh, experienced with this and they knew what to do when asset class is correct 40 50% right so us having not gone through a true recession before in the last two generations could act against us yeah i think it most definitely will mm. yeah so do you feel that there is one coming because there keeps there is talk around mm. uh, there's chatter around there's a recession happening it's already started uh, in your view is that true well recession as word is very fluid right like mm. uh, it depends on who is defining what is a recession like if america's definition were to be uh, minus 1% gdp growth for two quarters i think they in many ways are already in a recession right uh, in india if you were to compare uh, where inflation sits today versus where uh, our gdp is and i'm talking about the pragmatic number and not necessarily the reported number sure. uh, one could say that you know we are uh, prices of assets are increasing at a faster pace than uh, people can afford them or mm. faster pace than the net produce of the country and uh, that could be another definition of a recession so recession as a word i think is uh, fairly irrelevant i don't think uh, beyond a point it means anything uh, i look at benchmarks like uh, in inflation unemployment mm-hmm. wage growth uh, accessibility affordability of housing Uh, these as be- better benchmarks of how well the economy is doing uh, there are many uh, positives uh, to india uh, you know the fact that we've had uh, a consistent government and uh, consistent policy making ever since modi ji has been in power from 2014 right. uh, we might not see this so much in india but even today like uh, when i talk to investors from across the world they might be critical about their own country but when they talk about india it's with optimism i feel like on a relative basis we have become very attractive right. just by virtue of that consistency uh, you look at any of our uh, neighboring countries right nobody has had that right. you take bangladesh i mean bangladesh has been an anomaly and done well but you take pakistan or you take uh, anybody else in our region right. sri lanka uh, nepal in- right even china for that matter i feel like there is so much critique going on around yeah. what the communist party might be doing at this point or russia for that matter right. uh india has been pro business uh, i mean people might often you know you often see people arguing with the government right or left or uh, right of center or left of center right. but from a business standpoint uh, from from the standpoint of an economy whatever criticism you might throw their way net net they have been beneficial to how a foreign investor views india right uh, and for that reason i think from a relative standpoint uh, we are looking attractive to a lot of people uh, i was reading a report recently that uh, foreigner foreign in- invest- investors foreign institutions have invested as much as Three, three and a half trillion in China are suddenly stuck, and that money will need to go somewhere. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a certain portion of that finds it, its way into India. Mm. That's the positive. The negative is we've not corrected. We are still uh, vastly more expensive than many pockets across the world. Mm. Like Indian indices are maybe three percent from the top. but if you would be buying something in uh, say nasdaq for example 
you're getting a 60 70% discount uh, and a lot of indian companies are genuinely very expensive today uh, and the multiple we are trading at is closer to the top than to the bottom and and that is worrying we are attractive but we are also expensive mm. uh, so what changes first is you know anybody's uh, uh, call but i feel like uh, is it in a certain way also attractive to an uh, investor to take money out of india and maybe put it in nasdaq and tech companies which have fallen 70% uh, that's interesting too yeah uh considering where uh, all the tech companies the big the big 5 or the big 6 mm-hmm. all of them are suddenly seem seeming to struggle at the same time right uh it seems like there is a shift in the whole startup culture because i remember in the middle of the pandemic uh my friends were talking about how agar startup shuru karna hai to abhi karna hai like there is mm. senseless money coming in and that has stopped yeah. you were yours was i think one of the first startups that really blew up in the country and that culture has been going on till now where do you stand on this almost this wave of startups where now it's a it's a household term mothers and dads are telling their kids to yeah i think firstly i think people have to like rethink what the definition of a startup is mm. like we like selling ourselves as a startup because you know the word is cool and people like it but if you have to be practical about it you know as zeroda we've been around for close to 13 years now yeah. uh before that we were doing the same thing under the name of you know kamath associates we were not broking but we were sub brokers and managing money and stuff like that right. so is it really fair for companies which have been around for 13 15 years been profitable for that long to still call themselves as startups probably not uh but to your question i feel uh, the money has kind of gone away uh, you're absolutely bang on many many startups are beginning to struggle and will continue to to do so uh, a lot of these guys happen to be friends of mine right like i live in bangalore Uh, I see these guys for a drink every other weekend. We play poker in my house. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like even in terms of uh, how much somebody bets on a poker game, how <laughs> uh, somebody invests into you know other startups like right. uh, angel rounds and all of that. Right. All of that has changed. Uh, it's a completely different story today than twelve months ago or maybe eighteen months ago. uh people are getting fired left right and center uh, to find good tech talent was really really expensive and next to impossible one and a half years ago uh probably uh, from a relative standpoint all of those have changed uh and i feel like this is only the beginning uh, there has been so much froth in this industry uh to to even the point that you know it had become like a vanity metric like i would go to hyderabad for some meetings and uh, you know back in the day people would claim they have five properties and five cars and that was how you know in in rich affluent communities like yeah. the ones that exist in hyderabad yeah. people of, often flex using whatever is the benchmark of the time right the jubilee hill community exactly so that has changed from property and cars and assets to how many startups they have invested in i saw this like first hand last year and you know people were taking great pride in telling me i have 10 investments i have 30 investments i have 40 investments uh, so the bubble has not burst yet right. but uh, i think we're on the path to that uh, also mm-hmm. cost of capital having gone up in the west changes everything right like mm. uh, a pvc front from uh, japan from america i mean japan you still can because interest rates have not really gone up in japan but mm. in america a fund which was bringing money into india the cost of capital has gone up for them like 3x right. uh, if cost of capital has gone up so much their risk taking ability has gone up has gone down by a significant proportion right. so i don't think this will change mm. uh, when you look at Uh, inflation historically it never tends to be a six month or a one year problem it tends to be a multi year problem right. 
And for the lack of a better tool, the only thing one can really do with inflation is increase interest rates mm. to a point where it is above inflation. Mm. The only one who I remember who has successfully done it is probably Walker, the Federal Reserve Chair. Uh, he got, you know, like penalized for it and he got fired and he didn't uh, get beyond a certain number of terms. But somebody will have to have the courage and gumption to actually do that. Mm. Uh, leaders of today who are leading central banks across the world. Mm. And if inflation in the US continues to be 7 8% and interest rates from the current, uh, what is it, close to 4% now were to go up to 8-9%, uh, Volcker in his time actually took it to as high as 18%. Right. But if that were to happen and it goes up even to 10%, I think the risk-taking ability of a lot of these foreign uh, funds coming into India will go down drastically. Right. Uh, so I don't think this problem will end soon. Right. I feel like it's uh, it's just only beginning. Right. Uh, there will be a big cleanup where many, many uh, startups get devalued and uh, they become leaner and many shut down. And uh, I mean, it'll affect us as well, right? Like, our imaginary valuation that people talk about will probably get a hit as well. But right. uh, luckily, we kind of like are cognizant to the fact that it's imaginary. So it should be a little bit better. Right. I wonder, and this is just speculation on my part, on a psychological speculation, you can call it. Uh, because of this wave of enthusiasm for startups, there was a whole wave of people who joined in who didn't fully understand what it took the kind of effort that it took or the kind of uh, sacrifice that it took. Do you feel that is also one of the reasons why startups might not be succeeding? I don't think that way. I mean, I mean, like I was telling you about psychology earlier, I feel like the sacrifice and the hard work and uh, all of that are, uh, you know, all of those things matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as where you are at what point of time and what you're doing. I think the the timing aspect, right. uh, we are such a factor of good timing. We started after the 2008 crash, uh, the financial uh, explosion which happened in America where nobody was really thinking about broking, right? Nobody was thinking about innovating there. And we, uh, by virtue of that, we had a free runway for many, many years. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not taking any anything away from all the people who have worked on Zeroda and the incredible uh, team that it has and everybody who has contributed so much, uh, in most cases significantly more than me. I'm not taking away from that. But I'm, I'm saying that timing is, uh, that timing, that factor of luck probably determines how well a startup will do and how much it will scale, not just a startup, but companies at large. And unfortunately, for people starting off today, uh, luck might not be on their side like it was for many of us 10, 12 years ago. Right. Uh, if you ask any, uh, you know, like any startup founder or the founder of a company or a business who has done tremendously well in the last few decades, if they were to be honest and candid, each one of them will tell you there are probably... 10,000 people who are smarter, uh, brighter, more hardworking than them out there at any point of time. Right. Uh, the reason why uh, something works is less a factor of, uh, you know, one person, uh, individual and uh, how capable he is, but a factor of many, many circumstances. Right. I am not able to define it in an appropriate manner, so I call it luck, but... Uh, I think in my own defi definition that uh, luck is probably harder to come by today by virtue of what is happening in the world right. than it was for us uh, like five years ago when things were doing a lot things were doing a lot better. Right. I mean, it's not impossible, but the interest rate on luck is much higher now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as as a unicorn founder. What does your day look like and how has it changed, you know, in the last 10 years? Uh, I think I've become increasingly less relevant to everything I do. 
so I split my time between a bunch of things. I uh, do investment research, uh, zero the risk management, uh, managing money, uh, treasury. All of that takes about fifty percent of my time. I think I spend another. 25% of my time on a hedge fund I started a couple of years ago called True Beacon, yeah. uh, which is, again, uh, again, you know, everything is around like what my passion truly is. Uh, to like dull it down and simplify it, it, I would say it's to buy stuff for cheap, which people don't realize is valuable and sell it when it becomes expensive. Right. Uh, Very stock another... version of investment. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I spend another 15% of my time on a company called Gruhat. It's a prop tech and let me say carbon broadly, prop tech carbon fund, okay. uh, much like a venture capital fund, which we started about maybe one and a half years ago. And uh, the balance time I have, I spend on, uh, I'm talking about my work life. Yeah. The balance time I spend on uh, uh, different like, you know, hobby projects, charity projects. Uh, right. There are like some uh, charities which I founded where we're trying to like uh, look at a problem differently. Like, you know, not the old school CSR money or old people coming and donating, but get, get a bunch of young people like me who have gotten lucky in the startup space uh, to come together and uh, take a different approach to uh, solving a problem of the society. So that's work life. In terms of schedule, I pretty much start my work day at about 8 o'clock. I wake up at 7. Uh, I work from home most often, which is in Bangalore. Uh, so I, I think it's a big privilege that I don't even have to sit in a car more than once every four days or five days. Uh, and it's incredible. Uh, I try and go into my office on Fridays. I used to do a lot of in-person meetings, but I've stopped that. I feel like uh, it takes away more than it gives me. So I'm very uh, selective about in-person meetings now. Most often, if somebody were to call me, I'd say, let's do it on Zoom. Interesting. It saves time and meetings are shorter. Yeah. Uh, especially in a world where, you know, like for all of us, I, it often works out that eight out of 10 meetings are useless, right? Uh, so you can do them all on Zoom and the two which you really want to pursue, you do them in person and you take them forward. Yeah. The markets go on till about 3.30 Indian markets. Uh, then I do a bunch of Zoom meetings with, uh, you know, if I'm considering investing in a certain business, if I'm uh, talking to a prospective client, pitching to a client, it's very funny. I'll give you an anecdote here. Uh, for a long time, I'd gotten very comfortable in my shoes. But when I started this hedge fund, it required for me to go back to that place where you pitch to people and ask them to give you a part of their money to manage. Right. So it brought me back to reality you know, in, a way, in a very good way for me. Uh, because uh, when you're asking someone for you know a part of their uh, money to invest and manage for them, uh, you have to wait for meetings, you have to follow up on people, things which I had not done in the last many years. So it, it's it kind of like it humbles you in a very good way, which I think everybody needs in life ever so often, right? Yeah. Like if you surround yourself, I don't know if you saw this Chris Saka tweet today, he posted something in the morning about Elon Musk. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not talking to that degree, but maybe it 1,000th of that. Uh, success typically puts you in this position where you're surrounded by, I would not like to say sycophants, but I would like to say people who who tend to agree with you more often yeah. than yes, uh, contest yeah. what you're saying. But this whole going to people and pitching them a prod product and hearing no like a thousand times and then questioning your intent and uh, ABC has kind of been a good experience for me. But Leaving that aside, yeah, 3.30 day ends. Uh, I do a bunch of meetings till maybe 7, 8 p.m. And wow. uh, I try and go to the gym in the, uh, at night. So typically between 8.30 to 9.30 or 9.30 to 10.30, I go to the gym. I live alone. Okay. So I have a lot of freedom in terms of time. It's not like 
I have kids to go back to and you know play with in the night and stuff like that. So, so there are days when I feel like working out at twelve in the night, and I will do that as well. Right. And weekends are spent meeting friends. My parents, uh, Nitin, Seema, uh, they all live in Bangalore as well. So we uh, end up spending Sundays together, uh, maybe playing a sport or uh, it could be you know table tennis or badminton or. Uh, football or watching TV, uh, and Friday nights or Saturday night, one of the two, I would probably go out, uh, based on whichever city I'm in, and try and catch up with as many people I as I can. So, I uh, normally I kind of like I'm friends with the people I work with. Uh, this again is such a big privilege; people do not realize. Uh, beyond a point in life, I think the best thing you can do for yourself. Is only work with people you really like, people you want to hang out with. Right. Uh, so I have a group of fifteen, twenty people who work together, who kind of like invest together, who come up with new businesses together. So we all catch up, and right. uh, yeah, I think that's the week. Amazing. <laughs> uh, a couple of points came to my mind. One is that you are getting so much done. But at the same time, you seem to be a person who's, again, just like you told to me, uh, very slow, very measured uh, and calm. Uh, many people find it difficult to balance the two. They can only work in panic, can only, uh, you know, work when they're hurrying up. And it sounds like you've found, find a, found that wave of working slow and getting a lot done at the same time. I don't think I truly have, but uh, often people run around in circles thinking a lot is happening and uh, it isn't. I feel like even today, the amount of time I spend being productive is probably uh, 15% of my day or 20% of my day. Right. And I think that pattern exists with everybody. Yeah, that's that is that is beautiful. Nikhil, uh, thank you so much. I have taken all mm -hmm. the time that you've allotted to me. Um, you have been extremely gracious. The conversation was amazing. Uh, thank, thank you. you so much thank you, Sid. Me.